You may not think about it much, but you travel all the time. You travel to the store, to work, to hang out with friends. When you're traveling, you're taking a trip. This is how transportation planners think about travel, as trips. Sometimes it's a simple trip from point A to point B, like from your house to the dentist. Other times you're chaining trips together, like a whole series of errands. Where you go, what vehicle you use, and what route you take are all influenced by the land use pattern and transportation network of your community. Maybe you like to walk to get ice cream down the street because there's a nice sidewalk, but you always drive to the pharmacy because it's on a busy road three miles from your home. What's important for urban planners to consider is how to accommodate all of these various reasons to travel throughout the community and city. They wanna ensure that you can make it to your destination safely and conveniently. They're also trying to manage traffic and reduce carbon emissions. These are no small tasks. In this video, we'll discuss why transportation is so important, understand why people travel, and consider how planners consider various modes and infrastructure types. Let's get into it after the bike bell. The simplest mode of travel is walking. It's also the oldest transport mode as humans have evolved to move on two legs. Walking is cheap, does not require complicated infrastructure, and can be very direct. People on foot also take up very little space, making pedestrian infrastructure very efficient. However, walking can't get you very far unless you've got lots of time. With an average walking speed of about three miles an hour, most humans aren't willing to walk more than a half mile to reach destinations. That's why in planning documents, you'll often see five and 15 minute maps marked with what's called walk sheds, the distances from a new development or amenity that people can walk to in those amounts of time. In older cities like London, you can find maps on the streets with this information, which helps visitors decide if they wanna walk or take another mode. Speaking of another mode, biking is often considered the next mode that's very efficient after walking. That's because it can take you further than walking in the same amount of time, but it still requires the traveler to expend a little bit of energy. Biking can be incredibly direct, as bike parking takes up very little space and can be placed directly in front of or inside destinations. Bike lanes can also carry many people per hour, around 3,000 according to some studies at peak times. This makes bike infrastructure an efficient use of space, especially in dense areas. One of the downsides of biking is that it can be dangerous, especially on roadways without dedicated infrastructure. It also isn't ideal for children, the disabled, or the elderly, especially in areas with hilly topography or bad weather. Overall, cyclists and pedestrians are often referred to as vulnerable road users as they're easily injured by vehicles. Speaking of vehicles, the next mode that comes to mind is the automobile. Cars are far faster than walking or cycling and are often driven up to 80 miles an hour or more on freeways. They're also convenient, not having any set schedule, and they're private. Users of cars can choose if they want to go somewhere and what route they'll take, allowing them to stop along the way. They're often very direct, assuming there's convenient parking on either end of the journey. In fact, parking is one of the important considerations planners must confront when dealing with new projects. As most drivers expect a parking space to be waiting for them at the end of their journeys, many cities require that private businesses and homes build off-street parking on their land. This means that the car infrastructure is a far less efficient use of space compared to pedestrians and bikes. The average parking spot is over 160 square feet. Also, the price of freedom is high. Car ownership costs the average American $12,000 a year. Traffic, of course, is one of the biggest drawbacks that comes to mind when discussing cars. While driving can be convenient and fast, it often becomes slow and stressful the more people choose to drive as the roadways begin to fill up. That's why it's so important that planners incorporate alternate modes of travel into city plans to spread out the population across other modes like walking, biking, and transit. Public transit can come in many shapes and forms, both in system type and how separated from other modes they are. Some types of transit travel along their own dedicated right of way. Heavy rail like subways and trains are almost always separated, and light rail and bus rapid transit can be. The benefits of grade separated transportation can't be overstated. This type of transit has the largest capacity of any other and can travel great distances. The Japanese Shinkansen or bullet train carries 930,000 passengers per day at eye-watering speeds of up to 200 miles an hour. If all of these people drove instead, they would take up far more room on roadways than they do on trains, their travel times would be longer, and it would cost each of them far more. California estimates that when its high-speed rail project is finished, it will take 400,000 cars off the roads. This will of course have an enormous benefit for air quality in the area, which is often some of the worst in the country. This is because most private vehicles today use internal combustion engines, expelling carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as a byproduct. This is why transit is incredibly sustainable. The final mode worth mentioning isn't really a mode at all, but a type of trip, freight. Though most of us don't think about it, there's a reason why your Amazon package gets to your house so quickly. Whether by delivery van, 18-wheeler, freight train, cargo plane, or a combination of multiple modes, the economy relies on millions of freight trips being made every day. 
Planners often consider these unseen trips, making sure the infrastructure has the capacity to carry them along with passenger trips. It's also important for communities to think about these trips as large trucks create more air pollution than other vehicles. In some areas, like the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach in California, a huge portion of the local economy relies on transportation infrastructure providing a flawless user experience for freight operators. A flawless user experience for humans would probably look something like this. A really nice neighborhood surrounding a transit station. This is called transit-oriented development. TODs, as they're called, are important because they align land use and transportation in a way that makes it really convenient for people to take transit. This takes cars off the road and improves air quality. Sometimes transit stations don't have great neighborhoods around them, and they need something called infill development. This is when new housing or commercial space is built within the boundaries of a city, instead of on the urban edge. It offers all the same benefits I just mentioned, and is probably a lot better than the parking lots that often surround transit stations. Park and ride may have some logic behind it, but it's increasingly indefensible when we have a housing crisis. Land like this is just waiting to be reused. This can be particularly important for low-income households who may not be able to afford a car. Finally, infill development can reduce the need to build brand new infrastructure like roads and utilities in order to serve a new neighborhood. According to a study by the Sightline Institute in British Columbia, adding one mile of new highway lane will increase CO2 emissions by more than 100,000 tons over 50 years. Infill development doesn't always require brand new roads or sewer mains or power lines, as it's usually built within the existing developed area. Thus, it cuts emissions in this sector as well. Infill isn't just good for the environment, it's good for people as well. There isn't enough housing where people work, so middle and lower income people are being pushed further and further from job centers, forcing them to take longer and longer commutes. These commutes cost money, both for the car itself and for gas, and can adversely affect people's mental health. Now that we know how important infill development is, how can cities and states encourage more of it? Cities can unlock some of these parking lots for urban development by eliminating parking minimums. In 2022, California passed a ban on parking minimums within a half mile of transit stops. This means that businesses don't need to hold on to those oversized parking lots to be in conformance with the local zoning code and can put them to better use. And because those parking lots are near transit stops, it's also a transit-oriented development. Cities can also rezone or upzone land for more mixed use and wait for developers to take up the opportunity. That means allowing for higher density development within a zone or changing a parcel zone to one that allows for more density. Cities across my state are rezoning strip malls, auto dealerships, unused industrial areas, and more to include allowed uses like housing and retail. In San Jose, a city known for its swaths of single-family zoning, a program has been started by the city government to create little walkable downtowns by rezoning strip malls. While we'll have to wait and see if these plans come to fruition, the visuals provided by the city website sure are nice. This example demonstrates a relationship between land use, which we talked about in a previous video, and transportation. They're both so completely linked it's difficult to talk about them separately. Transportation allows us to get to destinations, and those destinations are land use. If we organize our cities to shorten the distance between destinations, we need fewer cars and shorter commutes. In the end, transportation planning is all about getting to people where they need to go safely, efficiently, and with a minimum impact on surround the surrounding environment. It's not an easy task, but tools like bikes and mass transit make it easier for communities to find the right mode for every trip.